Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, and I've had the pleasure of being part of CAFC's Rehab Network, the Canadian <clears throat> Network for Child and Youth Rehab, or CINSER as we call it, for a number of years now. And we're really pleased to be bringing this webinar series with content that is of, it should be of interest, or we hope is of interest, to the uh, childhood disabilities and childhood uh, re or children's rehabilitation services community. And we're very excited to be bringing today's topic. Um, this topic was actually suggested by one of our uh, very active members, uh, uh, Laurie Roxborough from Sunny Hill Health Center in, in BC in Vancouver. Uh, and she uh, mentioned to us uh, this topic, uh, today's topic, which is comparing participation in activities among children with disabilities. And our presenter is uh, Dr. Louise Mass of the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. Uh, before I hand over to uh, uh, Dr. Mass, I'd like, just like to mention that all of our webinars are recorded and posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network uh, on the site that you can see on your screen now. Um, and that will be on this, uh, we have a whole section on child development and rehabilitation. And uh, today's presentation will be on this page here. You can see we have the registration information here still, but this is where the audio visual recording will be appearing. So without any further ado, let me introduce uh, Dr. Louise Mass. Dr. Mass is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of, B of British Columbia with a joint appointment with the School of Population and Public Health. Uh, she's a level two scientist at the Child and Family Research Institute. And prior to joining UBC, Dr. Mass was the acting branch chief of the Health Promotion Research Branch at the National Cancer Institute at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, from, two, uh, from 1994 to 2001, Dr. Mass was an, an assistant professor at the University of Texas School of Public Health, and she has uh, ex expertise in psychometric, physical activity, and uh, obesity prevention. So without any further ado, I'm pleased to pass the virtual podium over to Dr. Louise Mass. Over to you. Okay. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge my uh, collaborator on this study, uh, including Anton Miller and Laurie Roxborough from the Sunny Hill uh, Health Center here in uh, BC, as well as Jen Chen and uh, Veronica Sheridy. And this is actually a secondary data analysis uh, from data that we had that uh, Statistics Canada had uh, collected, but we received funding from the Social Science and Humanity Research Council of Canada to do these analyses. So let me begin my talk by talking a little bit about the prevalence, and I, and I suspect many of you are familiar, but if you're not familiar, is the prevalence of disability worldwide is about 5.1%, and affects just about 93 million children worldwide. And if we look in Canada, the prevalence is uh, estimated to be a little bit lower at 3.7%, but of course it depends on how disability is measured from various countries. So it's around 5% and depending on how uh, the questions are asked, it could be a little bit less, a little bit more. Uh, so it gives you a little bit of background in terms of the prevalence. And many of you may be familiar with this, but um, children with disability end up utilizing a number of services, uh, including health, education, and social. And when we look at data in terms of how much service they use, even though the children with disability are about 5% of their population, they utilize twice as much of the health services than the other counterpart is about 95%. So this is actually quite important to worry about their needs given that they have uh, such utilization of uh, health services. And uh, many of you are familiar with that is that also that children with disabilities are, uh, it's important to, to make sure that they are well integrated into the society for both their emotional and physical well-being because it has a number of benefits, and certainly participation has a number of benefits. If you look at participation in uh, physical activity or any other type of activity, it's important to help them develop skills, um, to ensure that they have good academic achievement, and it's also very important participation to help them in terms of develop proper social interaction that would be important in how they function later in life in adults. It's important for mental health, physical health, so there's a number of health benefits when we think about uh, participation in terms of their uh, both emotional and physical well-being. And many of you may be familiar also with ICF, the International Class Classification of Functioning and uh, uh, Disability and Health, in terms of how they define participation. And, and participation is actually broadly defined and uh, in terms of 
you know, participation in this broad range of activities, both educational, social, recreational, and physical activities. Uh, but I also like to, to draw upon the Almquist uh, definition of participation, which is actually included in the ICF, but I like the fact that he reminds us uh, that participation is one thing. We could look at whether the children are participating in activities, but also what experience they derive from it is also important to figure out how do we assess that. Uh, in terms of they feel like even though they're participating, that they have an experience that's enjoyable or they're experiencing the activities to uh, the extent that they feel that they derive some benefit from it. And, and in terms of the way they participate, that it also takes into account the context. So it's not just the act of participating sometimes that we should only be measuring. And even though I'm measuring this, that being important in the data that was collected by Stats Canada, and, we, and what they'll be talking about, it'll be looking at participation in this somewhat reduced sense in terms of whether they're participating yes or not, without having really little information about the experience in the context. But I think it's always important to think about the larger picture when we think about assessing participation. So the group of children that I uh, focus on in this study is that we do know that overall that children with disability are increased risk for decreased participation. But when we look at the amount of data that we have that have examined that, it's actually we don't have as much data, but we um, we certainly want to look at participation broadly in terms of it participate in all kinds of activities. So we were interested in terms of physical activity, educational activity, and leisure activity. And what we know from um, other data in terms of children with disability, I'm going to be talking about two broad groups. And I'm going to be talking about two broad groups that are be compared in this study. So let me start about the first group that we have uh, uh, here that are um, that I refer to as neurodevelopmental disorder and disabilities. This is the group that is often uh, one that we uh, have a lot of services directed at. It certainly is like in, in BC, uh, the collaborators I'm working with, the, the Sunny Hill uh, Center, it's the group of the children that is often seen uh, when we consider like focusing on children with um, disabilities, that include children that have motor uh, disability, that more physical impairment, could include children that have cognitive disability, langu language and communication issues, social and emotional development, such as autism is another group that is often uh, we often think about, and hearing and vision is also another group, and. This group is often referred as children that have neurodevelopmental disorder and disability. When we look at the literature in terms of their participation in broad a range of activities, how do they compare to a typically developing peer? Is there is some data, but the data that we have tend to be a lot more for children with CP and motor, and a little bit with hearing and vision that I've seen, but we don't have a huge amount of data. But overall, we think that these groups have lower participation, although we don't have a huge amount of data comparing with typically developing peers. For some subgroup we do. And then when we think about children with disability, there's another subgroup that I will uh, use that label throughout my slide, but children with CHD, chronic health conditions. Now we don't typically, in the old definition of children with disability, we wouldn't necessarily consider them necessarily as part of that group. But they are actually part of that group. And then when we think about the ICF definition of disability is that all of us could actually experience disability in one time in our life if we have any health conditions or any issue that prevents us from participating in any of the activities that we typically do. And so children in that other group, chronic health conditions, could include children that have heart disease issues, cancer, asthma, diabetes, or allergies. And then, um, and these children could also be limited in participation in activity compared to a typically developing peer. The amount of data that we have for some of the subgroup is actually kind of limited and sometimes a bit mixed. Uh, so we've seen some data for uh, children with cancer and um, in terms of their physical activity and their participation. So children with cancer, the data that I've seen will show that um, once they're diagnosed and are under active treatment for cancer, the level of physical activity will, will decrease and much lower than when they were, um, they didn't have any health uh, condition. And, but they don't go back to the actual normal of physical activity they were doing after active treatment is over. And will still be having lower level of uh, participation compared to typically developing peers. 
Uh, when I look at data for asthma, asthma is another group that has been studied, but the data is mixed. Sometimes I've seen data showing like higher level participation and sometimes about the same amount of participation specifically for physical activity. And so in this study, what we're really interested was is what, well, we seem to have like, well, for us, we have a greater understanding that perhaps if you have a, a some level of disability that you will have decreased participation, although a lot of data is not necessarily that strong in terms of for all of the uh, groups of children with disability, but the the question that we had when we embarked in that, in, that in, in the study is that whether children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability has different level of participation in activities in the broad range of activity in comparison to children that have chronic health conditions. So the comparison is this one in red that you see the, that we were doing in this study. We have actually looked more broadly within the group, but this is not what I'm going to be presenting this morning. I'm going to be presenting like the broad comparison in the large two groups. So it's important to realize that when we look at these broad comparison that we're comparing two groups that are fairly quite heterogeneous, uh, but then we wanted to get a bit of a sense because the children with neurodevelopmental disorder are the ones that we have a lot of program for these for these children. We have policies to try to help participation for these children. And but for the ones who are, have chronic health conditions, they tend to be a little bit ignore ignore and fall between the cracks. So that was our purpose of our study was to really compare the participation in the wide range of activities, comparing the children with neurodevelopmental disorder with children with chronic health conditions in Canada. And the activities that we looked at was educational activity, social and recreational activity, and sporting uh, or physical activity. Uh, we also had in the data set um, the opportunity to look at what factor prevented them participation in the community. So I'll be talking a little bit briefly about that data as well. So let me talk a little bit about the methods and the data collection and the samples so you get a bit of a sense of the data that's presented today. So we actually analyzed data that was collected by uh, Statistics Canada in 2006. So that's the second data analysis that we conducted. And the data comes from the survey that's called Participation Activity Limitation Survey, the PAL survey. And Statistics Canada, most of their survey, and this one is actually uh, built like this, is that it's actually an um, add-on to the, the uh, census survey that's collected in Canada. And so what actually happened is that in Canada, people who fill out the census survey are asked four filter questions uh, to try to identify whether in the household there's a child with an activity limitation and to try to actually get a sense of how many children in Canada would have um, an activity limitation or potentially could be labeled as having a disability. And the PAL used to know what the, the, um, who the population is in Canada, so then they could subsample and take a random sample so that you could actually get an estimate with the PALs that are actually representative of the population in Canada. So they, um, it's a bit more complex, but I'm simplifying this, but it's a, they develop a weighting scheme so that the sample is representative of the geography, geographic location of Canada to sample across the 10 provinces and the three territories and to make sure that the sample takes into account the age of the children that is in Canada. So the, the sample that it, um, and I'm going to be presenting a little bit later, but in Canada, from the census is about 340,000, just a bit more, that would be uh, found to have um, some level of disability that could be a potential participant for the PAL. So what for the PALs was done is that 9,000 were surveyed, and the response rate was about 79%, close to 80%. So it's a sample size of around 7,000 that were interviewed. And the target population was zero to 14 years of age uh, for the, the child. And of course, the parents in the Gordon were interviewed and throughout the age range because certainly the younger children uh, can't certainly be interviewed about their participation in activities. Uh, for our analysis, we were focusing only on children that were 5 to 14 years of age uh, because we were interested in participation in school. Uh, for mainly of the activities, so we, we knew that the children would not have any participation in school unless they were uh, five or up. And the sample includes uh, children that are institutionalized. 
Um, so what the, um, we had to do, one of the difficulty uh, when you actually use survey data is that uh, we had to come up with a system to classify children as having a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, disability or having a chronic health condition. So certainly we had to develop the methodology for this. Uh, so the PALS includes um, ICD-10 codes, which is actually is a code to, um, to identify what the medical condition represents. And then in the PALS, there's actually uh, three main con mental health conditions that are asked in terms of like if your child, you, you identify that your child has some uh, limits or difficulty in participating in activities, we, they ask what are the main medical conditions that cause your child to have that disease difficulty or limit. So we looked at the ICD-10 code, but we also look at functionality in order to identify whether a child would have a neurodevelopmental disorder disability as well as a chronic health condition. Certainly that process is actually a bit more tedious, but we have one paper that will be coming out in terms of what methodology we use in terms of classifying children as having a neurodevelopmental disorder disability or a chronic health condition. And uh, we had two pediatricians on the project, Anton Miller and Veronica Sheridy, and we worked with them in terms of looking at the codes as well as all of the uh, uh, data points in terms of making sure that we would be able to classify children into one of these groups, either a neural developmental disorder and disability or chronic health condition. And as you could imagine, so we actually, uh, and every time we, so everything was double coded and uh, if we had disagreement, we had to sort of resolve that disagreement in terms of understanding if we we're able to classify either condition or the profile of the child. As you could imagine, is that uh, so we, we list what we include in neurodevelopmental disorder and disability, spend a little bit the definition so we include children that have motor, physical, growth or fine motor issues, communication, cognitive and learning. And reciprocal interaction is uh, autism spectrum disorder, hearing vision. And we also have psychological and psychiatric conditions depending on uh, how you define the neurodevelopmental disorder and disability in the literature. That group may or may not be part of that, but we actually included it. And for chronic health condition, it includes children who had asthma, diabetes, and the list is here. And asthma would only be included if it caused activity limitation, because some children could actually have asthma, but, but could have been missed from the census, because these parents would say, well, it has no, you know, it's been such, um, uh, it's either so mild, or they don't think it has any impact on their participation. So the only one that may get in into uh, the PAL survey is the one that the parents identify that their children have activity participation limitations. Uh, so those are the two groups that we ended up with. And um, so in the panel's data set, I said, if we draw from the um, uh, census, uh, we would have in Canada a little bit over 340,000 children that would have either a disability uh, or a limitation. When we decided to split our sample to only include 5 to 14, uh, that would represent about a little uh, more than half of the children in the population of Canada. And when you see how it gets split into children with neurodevelopmental, which are here, and you can see the sample size, 113,000 a bit more, and chronic health conditions, uh, a little less than 32,000. Uh, so that's the sample uh, and the uh, split in the sample that we had. And of course, we have some that we couldn't classify because either uh, the functionality in, uh, information from the parents or the ICD-10 code were not specific enough. Or we also had a portion of children that could fit in either sample. We couldn't actually define. So you have children that have asthma, but they could also have uh, a neurodevelopmental uh, disorder disability as well. So if we couldn't really figure out if they could fit in two groups, we didn't actually uh, make it a decision. They were eliminated, so about 17%. So that once we had our two groups, uh, then we were able to look at whether they were participating in a range of activities. And the list that was available in the PALS uh, is listed here, and I'll walk you through these. Uh, so physical activity is certainly a dimension that was assessed, and there was various things that, uh, that, that was used in order to assess physical activity. It was actually four uh, types of questions. And uh, so, the questions ask whether they were physically active 
in school as well as outside of school. So it could be anywhere in a community as part of a taking care of a, a taking part of an activity in a community program. And then it could be further split as to whether the activity is supervised, uh, having either a coach or instructor, or whether they participate in a physical activity totally in, unsupervised. So in the school setting, if it's a supervised activity, we're thinking more like physical education. That would be the type of activity that they are preferring to. And in school unsupervised is whether the child is physically active with their peers during recess and lunchtime. Uh, outside of school, physical activities, there could be any kind of team sport that uh, a child could be involved, uh, you know, soccer or uh, hockey or baseball, anything like that. And outside could be uh, free play, could be free play with their friends as well. And in the list, we also looked at educational activity at school, whether it was participated in, in uh, educational activities. And a number of social and recreational activities were also assessed, whether they were part of uh, educational outing. Actually, let me correct that. School outing is uh, more what was assessed. This is not always uh, educational. Some could be educational, but not all, all of them. And non-sports community activities, uh, like taking part in uh, either painting class or anything like that. Uh, community clubs like Girl and Boy Scout clubs or summer camps where the um, activities were looked at. So you see in this slide all of the activities that we looked at. And for the analysis, we ended up for participation in activities, and let me, before I talk a little bit about the analysis, is that what we looked at is whether the child was participating or not participating, participating in activity. We ended up dichotomizing the data even though the question in the survey asked whether they participate in activity um, not at all or once a week or um, at least once a month and so on. And when we looked at the distribution of the responses, it was either they don't participate or it's more on, on a weekly basis and depending on the activity, it might be on a monthly depending on the activity, but there was very little vari variability on when they participate on their frequency. So we ended up dichotomizing the data in terms of whether they participate or not. And um, because of the weighted sample, we took that into account as well in, in the analysis. And we also include a bunch of covariants uh, in order to um, correct, actually, our comparisons for some of the differences that the two groups can have uh, to start with. So the list here is now uh, shown on your slide is that for child, um, uh, indicator or covariance that we included, we certainly looked at age uh, to make sure two groups of infer in age, or I uh, want to take into account gender and whether they receive specialized education. That was another thing that we took into account. And we look at the degrees of severity of the disability in terms of uh, when we were comparing participation to take that into account as well. Uh, on the familial side, we took into account income, whether there was a two-parent family, whether they receive familial assistance, and the location of the family, whether it's urban or rural setting. So those are all the uh, covariants we include in the analysis. Now let me walk you through the uh, results. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to talk and uh, go walk you through the uh, descriptive statistics of uh, the two groups. So what you have on this slide is, so the NDD is the Neurodevelopmental Disorder and Disability Group. The CHC is the Children with a Chronic Health Condition. So the NDD, you could think about, is more like the children that tend to receive a lot of health services. They have either motor, vision, uh, communication, or autism. That would be the group of children. And the CHC could be health conditions, certainly asthma, uh, heart disease, or allergies, or diabetes. That would be the children. Uh, so when we look at the age, there's no differences in the two groups in terms of the age. When we look at the proportion of males, so you see that red uh, square here, and it, different, it, it indicates that there are significant differences between the two groups. And if you look at the percentage, is that the children with neurodevelopmental disorder includes a higher proportion of males versus the children with chronic health conditions. And we actually expect that because there are some disability where uh, that affects in the neurodevelopmental disorder disability more boys, certainly um, um, 
some of the uh, um, uh, some of the social and emotional um, issues affect more of the boys in terms of attention deficit disorders and, and a lot of other uh, health conditions as such. So we weren't really surprised, and that's kind of expected when we look at, at distribution in another sample. And for the chronic health conditions, we're glad to see that it's a split because we wouldn't really expect to see differences between who would be affected by allergy or asthma or even cancer by uh, male and female. Uh, we looked at born in Canada. It was not, not actually a covert, but it just gives you information about the sample, so primarily born in Canada. Uh, percent receiving specialized education, uh, we were expecting significant differences, and we see it here. And uh, because most of the health services are geared to identify children that have disability from that list and uh, have essentially policies or way of extending services to that group. So we were certainly seeing that. Um, that we have certainly a much higher proportion. When we looked at the severity of this disability, we also saw as well that uh, quite different for the children with neurodevelopmental disorder uh, and disability versus chronic health condition. And let me give you a little bit of background about these two groups and that's in this index. Is that that index uh, is calculated for severity of the disability. It takes into account um, how many issues the child has and how severe it is for the child. So for children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability, you have some children that will have uh, communication, language, uh, and motor issues, so they have multiple issues. And then the severity of the disability across could vary, but when, you, when the index is calculated, it, it will sum all of this up in a weighted fashion. And so, so these children will tend to have much more severe issues because they have multiple issues uh, overall. While children with chronic health condition might just have one issue, so that's why uh, the way the index is, uh, it ends up being a total flip in terms of the, uh, their pattern and how they look like. Uh, and then the next thing. Uh, and to look at parent indicator in terms of comparing the two groups in terms of income, two-parent family, there weren't any differences uh, between the neurodevelopmental uh, group and then the chronic health condition group uh, in terms of having two-parent family income and or whether receiving familial assistance. Although some people were actually, uh, when I presented that before, they were actually surprised that there weren't really a significant differences between the uh, children that would receive similar assistance uh, and expecting the children to have neurodevelopmental disorder to be much higher. So we see a difference by 5%, but it was not significantly different. Uh, and in terms of geographic location as well, uh, no difference as well in terms of urban rural location. So one of the uh, issues we wanted to look at is whether these two groups differed in their participation in a uh, broad range of activities. So this is the first slide that is looks at participation activity, and it's actually quite overwhelming, so I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, so first of all, let me highlight again that we see here in this column children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability, and the next column is children with chronic health conditions. And these are all of the activities that we looked at, whether they were significantly different or not. So these are unadjusted comparison, so, the, so you just see the raw data here. Um, and even when we looked at that, so I'm going to walk you through a few things. Uh, I'll go back to this slide, but let me, uh, one of the key points when I looked at that data is I wanted to get a sense whether, when we look at the raw data, is the overall participation level of these two groups, whether it's optimal or not. I came to the conclusion that it was not optimal, and this is how I broke it down. When I first start looking at school activities, I would assume that typically developing children would have 100 participation in educational activity or physical activity. Uh, probably the only one that I'm not sure what we would have 100 participation is the school outing because if it depends on requiring uh, money for your child to participate, so there could be not 100 participation. So let's go back to that slide now and just what I'm making you uh, see in a darker font is 
uh, only the school level activities and you can see supervised sporting, educational activity and school outings. So if we just go at educational activities, typically developing peers would have 100% participation on that because there would be no reason for them to be excluded. Uh, and then we see children with neurodevelopmental disorder much lower and even children with chronic health condition not 100%. So I would say it was not necessarily optimal. And the patterns would probably be a bit more expected. I'll talk about this a little bit later. And supervised physical activity, again, like less than 60%. Uh, but in this case, it's flipped in terms of who high, high level participation. And for school outing, it's around 70 to 78%. So uh, again, that I can't really put it in context. But for the other two, we think like it's still lower than what we would expect uh, than typically developing peers. Uh, we don't have typically developing peer comparison with the sample that I'm looking at, but I just wanted to put it in context. And for outside of school activities, it's really difficult to compare the published data. So the only data that I was able to find uh, that was collected in data using a similar question was supervised sporting activity outside of school, like in terms of uh, team sport participation. Uh, there's a uh, Canadian Fitness Lifestyle Research Institute in Canada collects a lot of data on physical activity. And so they ask in terms of participation uh, in sports among uh, Canadian children, and that excludes children with disabilities. Their sample size in terms of their range is 5 to 17. Ours is 5 to 14, so it's a bit of difference. And of course, um, it makes a bit of a difference also how the question and the sampling is, but we get a bit of a sense that the Canadian uh, Fitness Lifestyle Institute found that it's about 75% of Canadian uh, children would participate in sport, and our numbers are a little bit lower. Um, so we get a sense like perhaps they would be a little bit lower, although it would be optimal to actually have a comparison group. So it gives you a little bit of information about the, uh, uh, the sample. So the key point is we get a sense that the participation is not optimal for school activity and maybe some, some outside of school activities, although it would be great to have a comparison group for that. Um, so let me move on in terms of when we adjust our comparison. So now we're comparing the two groups, and we take into account that these two groups, the there's some covariates that might be different in terms of uh, differences in the, the, the uh, child level and fa familiar level. So when we adjust this, is this is the group differences that remain significant at an alpha of 0.01. Uh, I'm mentioning 0.01 is that we have not multiple comparisons, so we didn't do a full Bonferroni correction. If you're familiar with that, is that a Bonferroni correction would, would reduce your alpha depending on the number of comparisons you have. So we did a slight adjustment to that. So the red are significant at an alpha of 0.01, and then the other ones are borderline uh, significant. So what we see is we see differences in sporting activities in school. Um, both supervised and unsupervised between the two groups. We also see differences in educational activities and school outing that's somewhat of a trend. Uh, when we started that study, we were assuming or had set out as an hypothesis that we would expect that the um, children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability to have lower participation when we would find significant differences. And we were surprised that, that this is not what we actually ended up finding. What we found is that children with chronic health conditions were less likely to participate in physical activity at school, either supervised or unsupervised activities. So supervised would be in PE, physical education, and unsupervised would be more free play, and as well as to taking part in school outing that could in include anything. It could be educational, going, taking the kids to the museum. It could be a walk in a... Um, in a forest to learn about biology. It could be all kinds of things. So we found that children with chronic health conditions were lower, had lower level of participation for this. We actually had anticipated the opposite. Um, why do we think this is happening? Uh, well, we, we could formulate some hypotheses, and certainly I'd be interested to think or to hear what uh, some of the participants might have to say about our data. Um, but we actually think that um, I'm going to talk about more things that's shown in the slide here, but we actually think that uh, children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability is a group that has been seen as important to focus on 
And so there's a lot more awareness on how to identify on who they are. And in a sense, when we were thinking about the main differences between the two is that one of the group may, may be what we considered more a visible disability that's been, you know, it's much more easy to identify who's the child at risk and who should we be focusing on making sure we integrate. While the children with chronic health conditions might not be necessarily as obvious as a group, depending what the health condition is for sure. And the parents have also probably been more concerned about the children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability because that's the group that's been, you know, known to be discriminated against. And it's one of that parents as well as a lot of people in the community are really worried about it. Uh, so that might be one of the reasons why there's a lot more focus and attention to make sure that they're well integrated and there's been a lot of discussion and policy toward that group. And other thing that we thought about was, well, depending what the issue is in terms of chronic health condition, it could be that these kids don't have the stamina and fitness that their health condition really makes it difficult for them to participate in physical activity and potentially school outing as well because they might have some health issues that make it difficult for them to have the level of stamina and fitness. And depending what their condition is, if their condition is considered life threatening, parents in school may be quite happy to, to not force the issue because they're you know, they fear what the outcome could be if they participate and if they're not there to have a careful eye on their child. And the child may be also be less reluctant to participate and the parents may want to give in a little bit more. Uh, and that might be a lot of reason why these kids are not participating. Uh, the long-term issue is like, what will be the implication for these children to have lower participation now on the health benefit of participate, participating in physical activity per se, as well as school outing where a lot of studies have talked about that in a situation, the school, is, that the children are in a control environment, they have a lot of social interaction with their peers, and they develop the skill to become highly, uh, uh, to, to become integrated and in having uh, meaningful uh, interaction and, and uh, relationship. So does that or will have any implication long term? Uh, we don't know, but that's important to, to think about that. And the other thing that we saw was there was a difference in educational activity, and then that was the flip side. It was children with neurodevelopmental disability that were less likely to participate in the educational activity. Uh, we weren't necessarily surprised, although we have to be careful that the group that we looked at is really, really heterogeneous. Uh, but certainly we saw some uh, differences and not totally unexpected because we have, um, I went a little too fast to that slide, but. Um, the group of children that include neurodevelopmental disorder and disability includes a lot of children that have uh, cognitive issues uh, or um, uh, certainly um, uh, and emotional issues that make it quite difficult sometimes to keep them uh, involved in the educational setting. So then some of these subgroups require more help. Uh, so certainly we weren't surprised by that. Uh, and then I wanted to, to walk you through what other thing that we saw in terms of, you know, what other variable were associated with participation. So certainly we looked at the group differences. We talk about the bottom row here and uh, that we had differences among the two groups uh, in physical activity and school outing. And uh, let me just get rid of that line because we've already talked about it. But uh, we also saw differences in participation uh, based on a few uh, characteristics, either the child or the family. So certainly age, age was actually a little bit of an odd one because it wasn't significant across all the three variables that we looked at that were significant. And we saw only one age group uh, that had higher level uh, participation in physical activity. Uh, so the younger children went, uh, had higher level participation in supervised physical activity. And actually when you think about it, this one makes sense that uh, we would see differences or supervised physical activity in school. And supervised, we're talking about PE. So if you think about the educational setting, and it depends which country you're in, but quite often what actually happens from elementary to middle and high school, uh, physical activity uh, becomes more of an elective and they end up sometimes having less physical activity as they go up to the higher grades. And so that might be what's happening. However, I have to say that even though that was observed in that study, that there's a lot of policy and even in Canada that might make this association disappear and change because we're making physical activity more important throughout all grades and that's depending on the province. Uh, 
Uh, but certainly we've observed that and then we weren't surprised necessarily, necessarily by that finding. And the severity of the disability was probably uh, related to participation and as expected, more severe the disability, less participation in supervised and unsupervised physical activity as well as scholarly. And uh, some of the family who received familial assistance was also related to lower participation. Um, severity of disability and familial assistance had um, a low correlation, so you could say these two things might be measuring the same thing, but um, they're addressing both the overall concept of whether the child, uh, the severity of the disability, but they're measuring something slightly different uh, because we looked at whether the, these two variables were correlated, so both of these things were important. And um, so I, I talked already um, about all of these associations, but I wanted to say that the one that we looked at in terms of severity of the disability and receiving familial assistance is, is quite consistent with the literature. And for uh, the other one that was that we saw some uh, significant differences uh, between group, although more of a trend, was for educational activities. And we saw some similar pattern in terms of the covariance associated with uh, participation in educational activities. In terms of if the child receives specialized education, they won't participate as much, and that makes a lot of sense because uh, they're receiving specialized education because they're having a hard time and they have to have uh, on the side education for some of the aspects and severity of the disability. Interestingly, though, income uh, was actually an important variable, and families that had higher income. Uh, were more likely, the children with it, that was in these family were more likely to participate in educational activities. So family that had more income could uh, overcome some of that limitation in participation. How we don't know, is it because, um, uh, is it because that uh, uh, they, they, they are more educated, they more, are more educated and they could spend time there with their kids to help them with their homework, or is it because they're paying for help uh, it is actually a bit unclear, but certainly having higher income seemed to uh, help uh, with that uh, increasing participation. Uh, so the other question that we had is we looked in a data set uh, to identify whether there were factors that present, prevented participation activity, and we had information about participation activities in the community setting to sort of see what we could maybe find out in terms of uh, helping them participate in physical activity. Because um, one of the things that we did see is that even though we didn't see group differences, the level of participation was still probably not as high. Um, so we looked at, uh, first of all, when parents were asked, like, you know, is there anything that prevents your child from participating in activity in the community? There weren't really any big differences between children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability. So 38% uh, of parents says yes, there's something that prevents the community, but 35% of children with CSD. So condition didn't seem to be a factor as to uh, whether um, their child would participate in activity in the community. So we looked about, um, so there weren't group differences, so we looked about in terms of child and familial characteristics. So the questions that were asked in the panel, the reason that prevented uh, the child from participating are listed here uh, on the left side of your screen. So one thing that was looked at is recreational facility was not available, whether you know that was one of the reasons they wouldn't participate, uh, whether the um, building or equipment was not physically accessible, whether transportation was an issue, whether the activity is too expensive, whether they need someone's assistance, or whether they're too, too busy themselves. And so the indicator that was significant are only on their peers and, and also um, for which variable it was associated. So let me walk you through this slide in terms of looking at child indicator and walking you through here. Um, the only one that we don't really know how to explain is that why with age and the activity being too expensive uh, was associated. So we don't know if it's just a, uh, type 1 error rates, uh, but we couldn't really figure out a, a rationale for that. Uh, for the next one, uh, for specialized education, so parents that receive specialized education you know, find it much harder uh, to, to, uh, to have their children participate in activity because they find they also needed someone 
assistance in order to have them participate in activities, which seems to make a lot of sense. And another thing that we found is that if the child is young, then the family was a lot more likely to say they were too busy. Um, and we could see that you know, newer parents, like if we have data that shows that newer parents might find it much harder to participate because they're overwhelmed with their tasks. So in terms of dealing with being, you know, with parenthood, and certainly that could explain why we saw age be related to, to, to this. From the familial side, in terms of we saw parents who received familial assistance uh, were more likely to say that there's not a, uh, opportunity or facilities that are available for their child. So they probably think that uh, there probably is a need to create um, uh, programs for children that have much more of a, uh, of a severe disability in a sense. And of course, uh, family in the rural setting found that they were having less opportunities to involve their children, uh, which when we think about the prevalence of, of children with overall uh, disability being 5%, then it's really hard to have programs in certainly remote locations given that you're serving a small number of, uh, of children in these areas. And the family uh, income uh, was another indicator and uh, is that those who had lower income found these programs to be too expensive. So overall, when we looked at the, da the data, we didn't find anything out uh, that was not necessarily found in the uh, outer DNA that was not necessarily found in the uh, in previous studies. In terms of inequity in access to program in the community was certainly related to income, rural location, and where the child was had a more severe disability. Um, so nothing necessarily new there. So let me wrap this up and uh, getting ready to open this up for questions. So what we found is that overall we found that children with neurodevelopmental disorder and chronic health conditions had low participation rate in many activities. Um, and we did find that children with chronic health conditions have lower participation rates in supervised and unsupervising sporting physical activity and school outing. And that was a little bit of a surprise because we didn't expect them to be lower. And children with neurodevelopmental disorder have lower participation in educational activity than children with chronic health conditions. We weren't surprised by that. And so one of the key messages uh, is that we do know that children with neurodevelopmental disorder are a known group to clinicians, to policymakers, and try to make sure that they are integ integrated. Uh, but we do need to have a bit of an increased awareness of the need with children with CHD because when we're seeing lower participation for some level activities that could have potentially long-term consequences, we need to start thinking about what can we do to include them. So this is what our study has found, and I'll open it up for questions uh, fairly soon, uh, but we also have started to look at participation within children with neurodevelopmental disorder and disability because it's a very heterogeneous group, we know that, and we'll essentially have data that will be coming out uh, soon. Uh, so if you're fully interested, it's uh, in learning about that, uh, let me know either via email and I'll keep you uh, informed as to when we have the paper written and so on. Uh, the paper for this paper has actually been written for this presentation, uh, not yet published, but if you also want to find out about that, I'll be uh, certainly glad to keep you informed about that. Um, so I think I'm now uh, ready to open this up for questions and uh, and I'll turn it over to Doug, I guess, to sort right. of... Um yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Louise. That was a fantastic presentation, and I'm sure we will have a number of requests for uh, access to the to the publish uh, to the publication when when it when it comes out for this and for your subsequent studies. This was, I think, very interesting. Uh, we do have a number of questions. Uh, so, and this is just another reminder, as uh, Louise mentioned, that you know, please feel free to start typing in your questions now. We do have a few here, and we have about ten minutes to take questions, so we'll try to get through them all. Um, so we'll just start with this one. Uh, this one came uh, early on in the presentation, and you did sort of describe a little more detail around the topic of, of how uh, about severity of disability. But so this question may have already been answered. But uh, the, the uh, person is asking, how was severity of disability operationalized? Okay. Uh, so I often get that question. So severity of the disability was operationalized and taken into account. Um, I took into account whether the child had uh, limitation either in uh, um, 
uh, learning, speech, and so on. So it asked whether participation uh, was a limitation in, across, I think it was eight activities uh, that could be due to whether they have speech impediment or hearing impediment, uh, motor impediment, and so on. And so severity was taken into account whether the, ch the parent says, yes, my, my child has limitation due to this condition. And then, then to say to what extent the limit, like is it a lot or um, um, a little bit. And so it was sort of a, a weighted sum of all of these um, across eight, eight domains. And um, so it, it, in a sense, like when we look at severity of the disability, so if the child had issues with uh, motor, learning, cognition, so that would actually end up uh, more likely, uh, even if it's all mild, could have a higher level of uh, severity of the disability versus a, a child could have really high severity for one issue, could be uh, vision, uh, but then the index could end, could end up being a little bit lower. So that, that's why we have more than one variable to assess the dimension of severity in a sense. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I hope so too. I think I'm sure it did. And and, and as always, if uh, your question wasn't answered, feel free to, to type a follow up in, and we can always uh, get to that to clarify any other any other questions you have. Uh, the next question we had, um, you you mentioned a few times uh, of what the what the researchers were expecting to find, and that some of the results were not what you were expecting. This person is is asking why the researchers believed that uh, neurodevelopmental disorder respondents would be less inclined to participate. Because the, the, to this person, the findings seemed logical as children with a chronic health condition are often dismissed by teachers as having a valid reason for yeah. not participating. Well, it's, uh, so when, when we saw the result, we, we thought the result actually made sense, but we were actually start, starting with the premise and actually uh, we had, uh, in the paper that we're uh, writing, we don't have an a priori hypothesis because we can't back up our hypothesis as to which group uh, would be lower because there's nothing that would actually indicate or previous results that would indicate that we would expect one group to be um, lower on all of these uh, on all of these activities we didn't uh, we didn't really expect uh, we, we we sort of expected that they would be lower um, no data in a sense but we were just expecting because you know there's so much concern so much attention and so we thought like for sure uh, in the school setting that, you know, it still is a problem, but, but perhaps these policies are actually working. Uh, so in a sense, like, I walked you through what we were thinking, but when we saw the results, I, it made sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, the next question is, uh, uh, there's actually a couple questions along this line, so I'll sort of try and combine them. She, she's asking, what neuro, neurodevelopmental disabilities specifically were in the sample? And was there any one specific disability or condition that made up a large percentage of either group? Um, uh, yes, and my memory is failing as to the poor proportion in the sample and in the group. Um, uh, so, um, I'm not sure if I could go to that slide. Well, I guess we've already uh, left that, but. Uh, so, no, so we yeah, had can, in the uh, sample ch children with motor that includes uh, growth and fine motor. Um, we had language, communication, autism spectrum disorder, hearing, vision, and psychological. So it's essentially uh, we had six broad groups that we included. Uh, there is certainly a difference in the proportion in our sample, and I have to say I'm blocking on this as to what the proportions are. So I don't want to start talking about it and looking at it as soon as I leave to, to talk, but I, I certainly, if, uh, I don't know if you've included my email or somewhere, people have my email address. I, I can um, certainly, I can put that up on the uh, page on the Knowledge Exchange Network where this video, where the, the recording of this presentation will be and any other references to uh, any of the articles or the PowerPoint presentation, et cetera, anything you're willing to share with us, we can put it up on that page so that people can access. Yeah. So I, I would rather look at it because I, I'm afraid I might misspeak. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just did hand uh, control back over for you to put your, your um, 
your presentation back okay. up because we do have a question later on where someone's asking if you can go back to the slide that gave the percentages of participation. So we'll just ask you to pull that back up if you can. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll uh, just go on to the next question. Um, someone is asking, how were educational activities defined and measured? Uh, it essentially refers to uh, participation in school um, uh, in the classroom, in a sense. Um, and the, the survey, if you wanted to get all of the questions out there asked, like the specific wording, uh, the PAL surveys is actually available um, from the, um, uh, you could access this online, uh, so if you want to get the exact wording, but that was essentially educational activity like classroom activity. So I just put the slide, I think that's the slide that was asked to put out. So. All right, so uh, it was Denise that was asking for that slide. Just let us know if this is the specific slide that you were looking for. Um, so these these uh, percentage are uh, unadjusted, uh, the one that I have up. All right. Essentially, the raw data. Okay. Oh, and when someone else also provided a uh, oh, actually, Denise said yes, that's the one. Yeah. So, uh, you um, when you were talking about why um, why why there would be a correlation between income and participation, uh, someone is suggesting that Annette Larose has done some work on concerted cultivation and she has a she's provided an explanation as to why she thinks that income is related to increased participation so again one of the nice things about the knowledge exchange network is that on this page there is a comment section at the bottom so if you do register for an account which is free you can put these kinds of comments on that page so uh, I think this is from Christina uh, you know if you had a specific reference online where people could go to find this report I think it, people might find it very interesting uh, the next question is, uh, she was wondering about the impact of timing on of the interview for children with chronic health conditions. The re results will likely vary a lot depending on the health situation at that actual time of the interview. This is probably more variable than with the group than the group with uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, yeah, the, the, um, uh, the uh, both group are heterogeneous, but it's true that the chronic health condition is actually has some slight differences in terms of certainly the timing as to when the interviews are taken in terms of uh, depending what the chronic health condition is. So if it's asthma, it's something that's not going to disappear. But if it's cancer, uh, it could be something transient and then eventually they'll go back and be reintegrated. Although it's not necessarily the, the largest proportion. The larger proportion are children with asthma. Uh, the, the order that I had put in was the larger proportion. But it's true for chronic health condition, it could depend. Yeah. And, and one of the things that we don't know for some of these children, uh, again, the heterogeneity makes it a little bit harder. So that's when, it, when we start looking at the subgroup, it becomes a bit more interesting. So we won't have the opportunity of looking at subgroups of the children with chronic health condition because the sample size end up being much smaller for the subgroup. Uh, but we will have the opportunity of looking at differences between the children with neurodevelopmental disorder. And so we don't expect that necessarily every child with neurodevelopmental disorder have you know, lower level of physical activity. There's some subgroup that are probably driving a little bit more the uh, uh, the distribution. And then I understand the person I asked that wanted to know like the proportion for each of the group uh, because that certainly could have a little bit of an impact on that. Uh, no, the next question here is asking, when you state urban and rural participants, would that include on-reserve child populations? And I'll just maybe uh, add a little bit to that. Did you do any work in teasing out anything that was unique to uh, the First Nations populations, either on or off-reserve in general throughout this work? I don't believe that they're necessarily included, uh, reserves on reserve in the, in the sample. I don't believe that they're necessarily included. Um, so that yeah, there's not yeah, there's no we don't have any data on that. Okay, all right. Uh, the last question that we have here, and this is just a reminder, we are just one minute over time. But if there is one last question that comes in after that, we might be able to take uh, one or two more. But this is the last question we have right now. Uh, she's asking, it is a oh oh so this is someone putting in some information about um, that work around uh, concerted. Uh, uh, I don't remember what the, the title is here. I don't have it right previous question in front of me. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. 
In any case, she's uh, suggesting it was a qualitative study, unequal. The book title was called uh, Unequal Childhoods. Uh, and apparently there's an, an entire line of research in sociology. Um, this person's going to create an account on the Knowledge Exchange Network and maybe post some of this for us. So if you go to that page that I showed you earlier at uh, that's on the Knowledge Exchange Network, we'll hopefully have some of these, uh, these, these links to this information will be up there and we can maybe continue this discussion uh, online. But just, it, sorry, go ahead. Um, just to add, like some of the qualitative work uh, that I've read in this area uh, provides a much more in-depth uh, understanding of participation, not just whether they participate or not, but how they experience the participation, which is actually considered another important part that was not addressed, uh, that hard to address with the kind of data that was collected. Uh, so for some people that are really interested, I would certainly recommend that you read some of the qualitative works. I'm not sure the person is uh, citing that that work is, is actually, uh, that, that kind of work is addressing that, but a lot of the time they could go in a lot more depth about the, the whole experience, the context, and whether they feel included, because it's one thing to say, well, they're there, uh, but they feel totally alienated because they really are still ignored, even they're there. So, uh, so there's a whole work, uh, Whole of, a huge amount of work to actually look at participation in much more depth. So. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, yeah, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's always more uh, information to, to add to something like the as, as broad of a topic as this. So, um, so that's the last question we have, uh, Louise. Uh, any final thoughts? Any comments? I uh, know. I think uh, for sure, if people have uh, questions, if you want to post my email, I'll, I'll uh, definitely try and answer further questions. Um, and we'll be happy to do so. All right. Well, so, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It was, uh, I think we can tell by the number of questions and that we have gone over time here and still have the vast majority of the audience is still hanging online with us. There was certainly of interest to uh, to the CAFC community and in particular our CINSER network, our Child and Youth Rehab Network. Um, so as uh, you can see on the screen, for more information uh, about CINSER or CINSER's activities, you can we do have a website uh, that's part of the CAFC website at CINSER.CAFC.org or you can contact Vicky or myself. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Knowledge Exchange Network hosts all of our webinars, including this one, and this recording will be up. It usually takes me about, um, usually not more than a week, but a few days anyways to get the recording up there. And as we mentioned, there's hopefully will be lots of more information from the from the community links and other things that they might be able to add to this conversation. And as all, and you can also uh, follow us on Twitter or Facebook if you want to have more information. I'd also like to thank Lori Roxborough, one of uh, uh, Louise's colleagues and one of our uh, very active members of our CINSER network for uh, suggesting this topic and for connecting us, us with Louise. And if any of you do have any other topics that you would like to suggest for a webinar, don't hesitate to uh, contact Vicki or myself in the future, and we'll be happy to uh, work with anyone to, to bring some of this great content to the audience. Uh, so with that, I will uh, say goodbye to everyone, and I look forward to seeing everyone on the next webinar. Thank you all for attending.